Hello everybody, welcome tonight to the GMI Hub. This is GMI Hub's um, studio talk. So glad you, that you're here to be with us. I am Cheryl and this is... Daryl. <laughs> and we are your host for this evening. Thanks. So glad that you're able to join us. Tonight is going to be a very informative night. And the reason is with COVID and with um, everyone turning to live streaming for everything, there's always that big question about broadcast mix. How do we make it sound better? How do, like how come it doesn't sound like it should? Pastors are asking that. Singers are asking that. Tech people are asking that. So we have brought people to help answer some of these questions for you. We have on screen right now, we have Luke Hendrickson. Luke is coming, call, he's joining us all the way from Redding, California. He's with Bethel Church. And, and he's their chief technology engineer. He is also a producer, he's a musician, and we are so thrilled to have Luke join us. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Luke, welcome. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be with you guys. Awesome. And we have Dion, there you are, Dion. <laughs> we have Dion. Um, with us as well. Dion is right here in Ontario. He's also a mix engineer, a producer, and a musician, but he's with Rama Canada, and we are so glad that Dion can be here. Thank you so much for being here, Dion. Yeah, thank you for having me. No problem. And hopefully joining us will be... Um, Doug McClement. Yes, who is coming in right now. <laughs> and... Doug McClement is joining us right now. Doug is a well-respected, internationally known, award-winning live broadcast mix engineer. Um, he has helped this industry in so many ways, and I, I hear a lot of accolades about him. So he's no stranger to us. He's been with us before. We're just so happy to bring him back again. Doug, if you can hear us, welcome. Uh, hi. Sorry I was late. I had some... Uh hookup problems with my computer, but looks like we're kind of settling now. Are you hearing me? We are we're hearing you. Loud oh, great, clear. great. That's, that's good. That's okay. good. All is good. So tonight we're talking uh, talking about the broadcast mix. I've, I'm have i a professional video guy. I do the camera and a camera direct. And I keep getting calls from churches, especially the last month or so, continuously going, my broadcast mix sucks. It doesn't sound good. What can we do to make it work well? So I'm going, it's not that far from Easter. A bunch of the churches in the Ontario area, we're still under lockdown for another week or two or three, depending on what the government's going to do. And so as they're getting ready for Easter, they're going to want to figure out how they can get their mixes up and running for Easter real quick. So I figured perfect time to ask the guys that know how to mix broadcast programs what the secret is, what the formula is. But I think before we get into that, Let's talk. Um, I'm gonna let you guys just talk a little bit about what your preferred gears that you use to um, to do the mix, and let's keep it as an elevator pitch. We got only about an hour, maybe half an hour, 45 minutes with Luke because I know he's on a tight tight schedule. So Luke, we'll let you start first. Okay, uh, my approach is quite unorthodox. Uh, I've chosen to mix inside of a computer versus a sound console. And that is uh, for several reasons. Uh, one is portability. We can take our gear with us in a backpack or a carry-on device that goes onto an airplane. And you get the same sound no matter where you're at. I'm part of a group called Bethel Music, Bethel Church, and we're on the road constantly. And uh, you know, even international gigs. And to require that you get a Digico SD9 everywhere you go is unrealistic or a a uh, Yamaha CL5 or whatever, it's unrealistic that we're going to have to get the same thing every time. And consistency is, to us is a really big deal. So that's uh, one of the reasons. Another one is cost. Um, this method is a laptop, an interface, and a fiber cable that all fits in a backpack again. And so the cost is um, significantly lower than any console, uh, nearly any console. And then the third reason is power. Uh, we can use plugins from any manufacturer out there. Whereas a lot of consoles can utilize plugins as well, but you're fixed or stuck on the plugins that they have chosen to host, 
which is usually a very limited number of plugins. But if you're in a computer in a digital audio workstation like Pro Tools or Logic or Studio One, you can use any plugin ever made from any manufacturer. And then the fourth reason is uh, virtual sound check, which means we record and mix at the same time in the software so that you can save it for later on, multi-track record everything while you're mixing, and you can produce a record later on, a month later, a year later, but you can also hit stop during the sound check and go back to that drum fill and really dial in that drum tone exactly the way you wanted that drum tone to get without requiring the drummer to hit that tom 10 more times. So it's, a, it's an efficiency thing, a cost thing, a portability thing, and a power thing. So that's what we do. Wow, we're gonna have to, you're gonna have a lot of people asking like more about this, like what software do you use and how did you do that? <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's hear from the other guys. Um, Doug or Dion, which one? Uh, Doug, I noticed your mic is open. What What's your system? What do you use? Well, uh, my, my system is kind of unusual in that I, I'm dealing mostly with broadcast television. And so we have a, a couple of different things. I, mean, I do kind of two things. I, I have a, a truck that has a, console on a studio built into it and, and we do mostly we do mostly award shows and and, and big um, specials for, for tv um, like the, the juno awards and the much music awards and uh great cup halftime show and uh new year's eve for uh, niagara falls and stratford festival so um that's it's kind of overkill for for doing worship type stuff but 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 we have worked on obviously with Dion's with some other people in the past one doing some of the new year's eve shows at, out at uh, heavens uh, sorry at open heavens and uh and a few other shows and and um so i'm kind of spoiled sitting in my, my 40 foot truck with a ssl c200 96 foot console and, and uh don't really use any outboard gear because the console has a compressor and a gate built into every channel and I, i'm using i do use outboard reverbs um but the console itself in terms of broadcast one of the key instruments i find is is is, is the compression you put on the overall mix because if you don't do it somebody further downstream is going to do it and, and so the, the console has a built-in ssl uh compressor uh, if i don't have access to it that type of thing i like to use a, a crane song stereo compressor which i find is something that can really squish the mix without it being audible because you don't want it to be audible but but um this is always a big surprise i think to a lot of uh mixers that have not done things that end up going over the net or going over radio or television is how much compression and processing happens after it leaves your control and you kind of have to uh, the, the trick is you kind of have to anticipate that and, and so if if something's going through two compressors the first one is generally going to do most of the work so it might as well be yours rather than some guy further down the chain at, at, at the network or at the at the uh um you know at youtube or or, or whatever, whoever's broadcast pressing your you know nugs or whoever your, your streaming service is so i try to maintain control of that by by listening to it fairly compressed already so i don't get any surprises when i hear it off the air later on because there's a rude surprise i'm sure a lot of the people listening in on this have found that that you get your mix you think it's really happening wherever you're monitoring your mix and you're really happy with it and then somebody tapes it off the air and you hear it a week later it's like what happened that's not what i heard at all the vocals really buried and the snare drum is really buried and and you you know it's, it's something that's that's happened downstream of what you're you're monitoring and that's very very frustrating i mean it used to be in the old i'm an old enough guy that when we used to do live radio broadcasts on, on FM stations and it, nothing was digital, it was all analog. And so we'd be sending stuff to the radio station on bell telephone lines that were hewed flat from 50 to 15 K and we could have an FM tuner in the control room and listen off the air because there was no lag. It, it was real time. It was a speed of light. Whereas now, of course, since everything's going through satellites and digital and frame store, if you try to listen off the air, you've got a 10 or 15 second lag time. You'll drive yourself insane trying to do that because you can't listen to what the listeners are hearing in real time. And so it's, it's a little more frustrating. And in some ways, the modern technology has made it a little more difficult to react instantly to things that are happening further down the food chain. So, so um, it, sometimes it's a bit of an iterative process and you have to do a show and say, oh, that didn't work. I will make this change. And then you do another show a few days later. Oh, that worked. This didn't. And usually sometimes it's four or five shows. I know most of us don't have that luxury but but every time a new thing comes by like uh when it went from mono to stereo when it went from stereo to five one 
when it went uh, from five one to doing shows that were being broadcast live in movie theaters, which is something we've done a fair bit of. Um, every time I did that, it took two or three shows to figure out what I had to do to make it pleasant for the end listener. Um, and, and, and so uh, it's the same thing now with, with the first shows that we did were, were, were webcasts. I've, in addition to having the truck, I'm the uh, live stream mix engineer for the newly renovated Elmo Combo, uh, which is a tavern and a club in Toronto that is a showcase club that has a lot of great entertainers. And, and uh, we've done a few live streams of what we can do with, with the COVID restrictions being what they are. It was open for a while where we were allowed to have 50 people in the hall. And we did Julie Black and we did um, Gordon Lightfoot and, and uh, uh, July Talk and Kim Mitchell and a few acts. And, and uh, those were some of the first hour long live streams that I'd done strictly for over the computer. And, and uh, even that took a little bit of, you know, the first couple were a little rough. And then, uh, uh, and then we, we learned. Well, one thing I did find um, is that is there's quite a difference between what happens to spoken word and what happens to music on those shows. And you find that you have to push the spoken word stuff more than you'd think to keep it consistent with the music level because of the processing that happens downstream. So in some of those shows, I'm mixing the, the, the pastor or the, or the vocal, uh, the spoken vocal louder than it, I think I should be doing um, to make it fit with the music. Because otherwise people are getting up and having to adjust their home listening environment all the time and that drives people crazy. So, so uh, that's one thing I've learned on the, for some reason that seems to be happen more on the live streaming than it does on broadcast television and broadcast radio is that somehow the, the, the level is not as consistent from spoken word to music. I don't know if, he, if, if Dion and Luke have found that, but, but uh, it was kind of a rude awakening the first couple of shows I did. And then I heard them off the air and I thought, geez, was that my mix? Was that, what was I thinking? You know? So I'll probably talk too long about that, but, but uh, uh, at the Elmo combo, again, we have the luxury. It's an SSL 550 console uh, with onboard, TC electronic reverbs and, and all kinds of processing. So I, I don't use any plug. I basically use Pro Tools as a big tape deck. I do virtual sound checks, but I have no plugins in my Pro Tools at all. It's all console or outboard plugins. So it's a little different because of the power in the consoles that I have at my disposal for what I'm doing. Wow. That was awesome with all the stuff and the stories. I, Doug, you have so many stories. Someone's oh, that's because I'm old. Someone's got to do a radio <laughs> or a, a broadcast just with you telling stories, but that's not this show. Yeah. But Dion, <laughs> uh, yeah. your elevator pitch on the gear you use or the gear you prefer to use. Wow. Um, I have a unique situation because um, if I'm working offsite, I'll be strictly in the console. That could be either like um, a Midas uh, Pro X or I'll be at, at home, we got SD9, so I'll be totally in the console. But as of uh, our recent situation with the lockdown, um, we are uh, we actually pre-recording a lot. So um, I'm in Pro Tools. And so um, a lot of what we're doing um, at Raymond, we're, we're actually uh, pre-recorded. So I have the luxury of going back and what Luke was describing as far as going back in and listening and tweaking as we go. And um, another thing I'm doing, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm on headphones. So not every room that I'm in, it's a uh, good monitoring. So I got like a pair of Sennheiser 650s and I don't leave home without it. That's in my knapsack and I, I walk with that. And I have a special kind of monitoring situation for um, my listening level, my, my listening. And I just have a laptop and my uh, my interface and my headphones and I'm, I'm rocking with that each and every time and i i find that uh, along with that i actually have this little cheap laptop <clears throat> and i have this meter uh uh it measures uh bluffs so that's uh loudness uh units full scale and um for youtube we're like at minus 14 so i just have that meter going on this cheap little laptop on the side and I can monitor what's happening um, going to the stream for like things that Doug was mentioning, the speech levels and what have you. So if I see it dipping down too low, I just write it up and I can, I can make it happy. Doug, Doug, 
touched on it a little bit, and I know Luke's touched in on it a bit, but the philosophy of the way you mix. So when I call, if I was to call you, come in and to mix my show, or I show up at your place, how do you walk through how you're going to build the mix? Yeah, I think I think it all starts with um, like the band and uh, who you're working with, and and that 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 could start at the track sheet. You know, just making sure we have an accurate um, account of the players and who's going to be singing. If there's going to be any sort of sort of uh, spoken um, word, you know, um, building from there, and then we can build out and having a good relationship with your your uh, uh, as a techno th technical director, having a good relationship with the with the band director, and seeing what um, his needs are and making sure that um, we're actually tracking it um, correctly because they may have a, a certain sound that they're trying to translate and things could get lost in translation if you're just mixing for balance versus understanding exactly uh, what the mix um, elements are and how you can make them be more cohesive so that it translates so that things do not get buried and that they get more pronounced when it should yeah, just I guess knowing your band. Yeah, yeah that that um, input information is really key. I find that quite frequently I get I ask for an input list or at a stage plot, and the management will send me the list, and then the band arrives, and the list that I have is not what's happening on this tour. Like the, it's the who sent you that list? That's from like two years ago. And it's like your management sent us that. Like you, you know, and that's very frustrating when you've laid out all your stuff, all your console and your drums and everything. And then, oh, no, no, we now have four toms, you know, and, and everything has to move down to it. And, and so that's one thing uh, where the advice out there for band members is, is, you know, make sure you have the input list that you're sending in advance, that you're advancing the gig with is current and up to date. Or the other thing I run into, and I don't know if this is so true on worship shows, but um, often we're doing one song, like on an award show, I'm doing one song with the band. So let's say, I don't know, uh, uh, Brian Adams is on, on the Junos this year for, or something, you know. Um, and they, so management sends us the input list and it's got like 60 inputs on it. And then he shows up, oh, the song we're doing on the show, there's no keyboards and there's no backup thing. Like there's, they drop 17 inputs off this thing. And it's like, well, how come you knew what song you were going to do? Like, how come you didn't send us that list? Because we've got the whole board spread out. And now we're going to have holes that spread over four pages on the console. We could have put it on two, you know, like that's very, very frustrating. So, so it's, having accurate information starts the day off right and then uh sort of going from there on the, um uh as you, as you say the it's all about communication with, with the mixed guys and, and um i mean we're all there to make it amazing you know it's, it frustrates me sometimes where i don't see this so much with the big bands but with the smaller bands like, oh, our guy has to do the mix and our guy has to do, and like presumably the venue has hired you because you're good at what you do and you know the house system really well and you're not there to make them sound bad. You want it, your name's going on it too. So you, you want it as you know. You don't want to go out there with bad with your name on it. So it's not like we're there to arm wrestle with the band. You know how can we make this sound better? You know if you've got a certain sound that you're after, maybe you bring in the get, send us email us the CD in advance so we can get a feel for where, where the band sits. You know how large, how loud, much reverb do you like on your vocal because it's different for different acts and. You know, you can't make it sound exactly like the record, but at least you know what they are shooting for, you know. And, and uh, I don't know if Luke and Darren, do you one of these situations where the band has their guy in the room with you, uh, sort of supervising, maybe doing some production and stuff? I, th th that used to be a big problem 15 years ago because a lot of people were pretty, there was such a cavern between live sound and, um, and, and broadcast sound. Now I... I see us using a lot of the same mics. A lot of the guys who are doing live sound have home studios. And I find it, it's a lot less likely that the guys in the room with you is going to give you bad advice. But it used to be, sometimes you'd be arm wrestling with the guy for three hours because what they heard and what you heard were two different things. I don't see nearly as much of that now. Usually the advice that I'm getting from the band's representatives is valid and, and uh, helps the situation. You know, because you've got to figure they've been on the road with the band for 40 dates. They know... You know, oh yeah, maybe we should dip the bass player's vocal a bit because he's you know not, not the best singer, and uh, let's add a little reverb to this singer, and, and uh, you know that type of thing. The things that you couldn't possibly know unless you'd seen the band several times. They they can really 
help you out you know, with, with that information too. So, so having the right information is really key in advance. Um, and uh, and that's, that's the, a good starting point at least. So, and if there's particular things they want, is, if they want a particular microphone for that vocalist or a particular thing, if, if you can endeavor to get that for them, that's great. A lot of situations you can't, but sometimes just getting a little thing that makes them feel comfortable can, can help win them over early in the day too. Well, uh, the, the two guys have some really great points. Uh, excellent uh, recommendations there. I would agree with, I think, all of those points. I think where I would probably start is um, good source, good sound starts at the source. And so I'd be looking at, again, the input list, of course, and then also the backline gear. What's the drum kit they're using? What's the guitars they're using? What kind of amps are they using? What kind of vocal mics are they using? And a big one here is stage noise. Uh, how do we get the stage, the, the floor noise down? Um, whether you have floor floor wedges or um, the the stage plot itself, are, how far are the drums away from the lead vocal mics? Um, what kind of audience mics do you have? Audience mics are a huge one. Where are they placed? Not just how many do you have, but where are they placed? Um, all of those things are gonna add up way more to the quality of a mix versus whether you're not using uh, an 1176 compressor or an LA-2A compressor. So doing that, a ton of homework on the front end is, is going to be a, a huge uh, pat on the back for later on trying to get good tones out of your stuff. Um, then another one, of course, is, is being there during the sound check. You know, I think uh, uh, it's easy to get disconnected when the sound check is happening and then when the show is live and that's when you're trying to scramble. But doing as much homework as you can ahead of time. And I know the pros, the pros pay attention and that's why they're the pros. So. Um, you know, just really paying attention during those sound checks of uh, dialing in the tone. But then also, you know, one of the get, one of the guys made a point is having a good relationship with a band um, here at Bethel. That's just so key for us. Uh, we don't have a divide between the production team and the worship team. We're all on the same team. And um, the room I'm in right now is actually the mix room for broadcast, but it's also the green room for the worship team which means as soon as the band is done, they come back to this room. There's two couches, there's a piano, there's Pro Tools, there's a console. We all have breakfast together. We're friends, we high five each other. We open up the Pro Tools mix and we solo out the guitars. We listen to that harmony. Hey, what's it like if we, if we take it down a half step? Hey, what if we uh, added a double chorus on this part? It's a really fun friendship, hangout, interactive time. And so that, that relationship piece really goes a long way and it doesn't feel like an us and them type of thing. And that happens early in the day too. Like you want to get, I find, um, for example, with the drummer, qu quite often in the studio, even uh, especially, you know, a guitar player can poke their, they can still be connected and they can hear what they sound like. And the, and the uh, uh, keyboard player can bring their keyboards in and plug in and hear what they sound like in, in the control room. But the drummer can't do that, obviously. So I always find it's good to record a bit of the, when you're doing the sound check, it's always good to record a bit of the drums uh, and then have the drummer come in and listen to it. And so he or she has some input. To their sound and man if you get the drummer on your side early in the day that that really pays big dividends later <laughs> later in the day because often they're neglected you know because that, that nobody wants to hear their input and, and uh just a little thing like that can can make a big big difference and as luke said that, that you know mic placement mic choice getting it sounding good at the source means you have to do a lot less corrective surgery further down the, the food chain you know if you if you walk out on stage and it's really happening you know, just set the mics up and get out of the way is, <laughs> is part of the, the gig, I think. But 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 sometimes, you know, it starts with younger bands that they, you know, and everybody is turning themselves up too loud on stage and then the, back, the front of the house guy's fighting that. Um, that's that's a critical thing. Um, stage placement. Um, I found that, you know, there's always the debate, you know, do we have plastic in front of the drums? Do we not have plastic in front of the drums? Do we? Do we put the Leslie off stage or under the stage or in a back room somewhere? Is it out on the stage throwing sound all around the choir mics? Uh, um, these are all issues that kind of have to deal with it. It's a, I find it's easier it's in, in, in worship music and gospel music uh, rather than in my award show world. It's a lot easier to get the drummer to play behind a plastic scrim than it is in, in most of the things I do. Because the worship community has kind of accepted that look and, and is, is not as upset by it. But... Uh, I, I have a lot of arguments on, on the shows I do trying to isolate the drummer, and I usually lose the video. Um, they they tend to uh, to dominate in their own situations, and uh, uh, it's a thing. Um, but but 
I you know, usually start with, I think everybody usually starts with the drums when they're doing sound checks and, and, and then you kind of keep adding people. I find it's good not to have other guys on stage when the drummer's doing a sound check because they, musicians by nature like to noodle on whatever instrument they're playing. And you've all been there when you're trying to get sounds on the drums and some guys wailing away on the guitar or the keyboard at the same time. It's really frustrating. It's better if they can just hang off the stage until you at least get the drums settled in and the other stuff doesn't take nearly as long because it's usually one or two channels per musician. But with the drums, you're dealing with eight to 12 channels for that one person. And it, it, it takes a fair bit of, it's an iterative process. It takes a fair bit of concentration to get all those things balanced properly, I, I think. Um, so so that, that requires a little bit of psychology. I mean, half, <laughs> I'm sure Dion and Google's test us, your technical knowledge gets you through probably 40% of your day. I, I mean, most of it is cooling people out and, and trying to kind of get people to do what you want them to do and make them think it's their idea. <laughs> you know? um, like just, it's just personnel management and, and, and trying to make them think of a band rather than just their own, their own instrument. You know? Well, I love the fact that you both have brought up that the importance of the tech side and the band working together. I love that because that is something we've actually touched on this in another uh, episode, but I'm glad you brought it back up because it is so important. Um, I just wanted to interject just to invite the people that are watching right now. You are listening to uh, three fabulous mix engineers, live broadcast engineers that are well known, well respected. We have Doug McClement, who you just heard, um, who is award winning. He's here in Ontario. We also have Dion Coquette as well in Ontario. And we have all the way from Redding, California, we have Luke Hendrickson, who is the chief mix engineer for Bethel. So um, I just wanted to invite you that if you're watching this for the first time, um, definitely listen to this conversation. If you're enjoying it, we ask you to share the experience, like the video, give some comments, ask your questions. This is the time. You don't get this this kind of mix on a regular basis, pardon the pun. So, you know, but Luke, you can Luke's, search... Luke's smiling because he's not, he knows that he hasn't got 12 inches of snow coming in overnight. Which is <laughs> Dion, Dion, Dion and I know that we're going to be spending the morning shoveling our cars out of the driveway. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Expecting a foot of snow here tonight. <laughs> But you don't get to talk to these people on a regular basis. So now's your chance. Send your questions in the chat and share this experience. I mean, there's probably a lot of organizations and churches and individuals that would love to know this information. So definitely do that. And of course, subscribe. Um, back to you. Okay. I'll, I'll share a little story because we just came from talking about getting to know, know the band with the band, hanging out with the band. Um, Early, well, probably mid '90s, I was doing a live event with Bobby Mason, and her personal assistant, probably for an hour and a half, kept pestering me about wanting to give me a coffee, coffee and a donut, coffee and a donut. I didn't drink coffee, and I wasn't hungry, and I just kept saying no and no, and it actually got almost to a point that I was getting frustrated. I just said, "What's up with you having to give me coffee?" She goes. Bobby Mason gets mad if I don't give the sound guy anything because. That means he's too busy to sit down and have a coffee and be relaxed to mix the show. So I said, okay, you know what? I'll take a hot chocolate and a chocolate dip donut. And she goes, great, because now Babby knows you're taken care of, which means you will take care of me. And wow. it's really interesting coming hearing that because that just helps. From what I found, when you spend time with the band and the sound guy, even if it's a coffee, gets they just work well together because you don't know how long the sound guy's uh, been without anything to eat or drink on most days that you're in recording and all that. So there's my little story. So I'm going to just continue on with the next question. And you, um, it was brought up ambient microphones. There are people who don't know what they're for and how to use them and where to place them. I'm a big fan of shotgun microphones. They're very focused microphones. They're excellent at rejecting side noise. And on a stage, uh, you're going to have a lot of side noise from the, uh, from the stage, um, floor wedges or the drum kit, as well as from your PA. And so uh, what you pointed at is what it's gonna pick up. Um, and so I will put them downstage center or downstage wide, which means kind of like right at the, uh, right where the base of the stage is at. And um, 
I'll put them up high. Up higher is better because it gets above the the eight people that are at the front screaming their brains out and it gets above their heads so they can hear the people behind them. And so whether it's 10 feet up or 20 feet up, it doesn't matter, just anywhere in there is gonna be great. And the more you have, the more redundancy you have. So two mics means if one person screams really loud in front of that one mic, you're gonna hear that scream a lot. But if you have six or eight or 10 mics, then if one person screams in front of one of them, then it blurs with all the other mics that you have. And so I'm a big fan of uh, as many mics as you can get. And I know there's always restrictions on input lists and things like that. Uh, but if, if it were my go-to, I'd probably put four across the stage. So a, a stereo set out wide, uh, up high, right in line with the PA, just under the PA, which is great. And then another one down stage center, which, you know, those could be like down in the pit or something like that. And uh, if you've got extra inputs, then put them all around the arena. So put a stereo set up front of house, put a stereo set up in the up on the rafter somewhere. The thing you got to cons be concerned about as soon as you start doing those distance one is time aligning things. If you keep the ones on the stage and don't use the ones out in the room, you don't have to worry about time aligning because they're in line with your PA and it's really easy. If you start putting them out inside of your arena, uh, out in the, in the audience, you got to be careful uh, with the time aligning problem or just tuck them down really low so you don't really hear the slap back quite as much. So how do you put them into the mix? Like, where do you start off? Because when you do high pass filter, tech, there's nobody there. High pass filter, everything. There's always too much low end in those things. You're trying to focus on a vocal and the vocal doesn't do anything below 300 hertz ish. So just get rid of everything below there. You could high pass it as well. Uh, I'm sorry, high pass and low pass both. I'm sorry. Uh, you could low pass it at say 12K or 10K or something like that. And just clean up a lot of the low mids. Those things just have so many low mids. So just clean up a lot of that stuff. Um, and just pan them hard left, hard right. I'm a big fan of hard panning everything and it's gonna get you a wider mix. Um, and pull them down when the band is really cranking, put them up when the band is not cranking. That's typically how I do it. Um, the crowd is there to kind of fill in the gaps. And when the band is doing something awesome, let the band shine. And uh, if the band is not doing anything awesome, then kick the crowd up and let them carry it. I mean, that's, that's a general rule. Yeah, I'm I'm actually uh, doing the same thing that Luke is doing. Um, I have shotguns. Um, actually, I have my shotguns out, and I have uh, some pencil microphones in. Um, I have a combination of both, and then I have a rear uh, stereo mic, thanks to Doug. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm actually uh, I'm glad Luke mentioned about. Um, the, the time and the time delay. I have a question. Luke, are you tying back your, uh, your uh, PA to your stage? So we don't change anything with our PA. The PA is as fast as it can go. This, yeah. The time alignment would only happen for the broadcast mix. And what I would be doing is I would be pushing every single s channel back to match the stereo set of mics back at front of house. So, you know, whether that's 20 milliseconds or whatever it is, depending on the distance that you have there. Um, I, th there's a problem with that though, is, is it delays your entire mix. And if you're doing live video and your audio is delayed another three frames or 10 frames, your video guys are going to complain. And so that's something uh, that I will usually avoid if I'm in a truly live environment. I might just, I might just save those mics for later. And then in post, if we produce a record, I will nudge them in Pro Tools uh, back to where they belong. Yeah, I'm doing the same thing for post. I haven't yeah. I haven't done it in live because um, the reason why is because we're working with volunteers and they push that thing up too high and yeah, it, your mix is off. It really blurs your snare <laughs> drum every time that snare hits, just bam, 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 bam. Yeah, I try to use a variety of different ambient mics in the room and, and it depends. I find that every time I add a pair of mics, it's like adding another thousand people to the mix. So if I'm in a, in a 500 seat, room, I would use probably, um, well, so let's start with a smaller room. Say you're in a 200 seat room doing, I do comedy shows and stuff sometimes. Um, you know, four mics, I never go over with less than four because as Luke says, if you just go with two and one of those mics conks out. That's but right. the weird thing is, you know, it's easier for you to get to a floor tom mic or a guitar mic during the show than to get to one of those audience mics. Like if you lose an audience mic and you only put up two, now you've got mono audience. So I always put up four and that way if one of them fails or cable starts to buzz or somebody steals it, which happens, um, you've still got a pair somewhere that you can get the sound on. 
Um, now, if I'm in a 1,200-seat hall, I'm looking at probably uh, six to eight mics. Um, when we go to Massey Hall, which is a 2,200-seat room, I'm using below 10 mics in there. And in a hockey arena like the ACC, 12 mics. Uh, we, last November, we did, the, on Netflix right now, there's a Shawn Mendes uh, concert video. We, we did that in Toronto last year at the Sky Dome, where the Blue Jays usually play baseball when COVID isn't happening. And that's a 55,000-seat room. Um, and it was sold out for Sean. And we put up 14 audience mics in that room because a show like that too, half of it's the sing along and half of it's the girls singing along with him. So, so it's really important to capture those, those people and not capture the PA. So in addition to shotgun mics in those big venues, uh, uh, and, and we did the Billy Graham crusade in there, uh, 20 years ago, in the same room in the Sky Dome. Um, Long enough ago that it was all done with eight app machines, <laughs> eight app machines. Um, but but uh, you not only can you use shotgun mics to prevent the PA from getting into your audience mics, but another thing I've been using lately, uh, the last six or seven years, um, have been figure eight microphones, which have remarkable rejection on the side of the eight. So I I will put them over the crowd with the one of the figure eight balls uh, uh, patterns facing down at the crowd and the side of the mic facing the PA and you get almost no PA in those things. They're, they're like beamier than a shotgun mic in some, some way. I picked this up. We were doing Kenny Chesney outdoors at a, in, on the Jersey shore in Wildwood Beach, New Jersey. And there was like, it was a free concert. There were 70,000 people there. And they brought this engineer over from England and he had this idea of, of putting these uh, figure eight mics over the crowd. And I thought, I don't know. And man, when they put it up, I couldn't believe the isolation that he got off that stuff. So I've been using that trick ever, ever since. Um, and and as, as Luke mentioned too, uh, sometimes your front mics can get, if the stage is really wide, and that's certainly the case in worship services where there's a choir, um, you can end up with kind of a hole in the center of your audience mix. And I will sometimes, lately I've been putting PZM mics below the lip of the stage in the center. And they... A, people don't know their mics, so they don't tend to sing into them. Um, and, and they will, I, I'll pan those a bit more to the center, like 11 o'clock and 1 o'clock. And that fills in my center, and, and you're picking up the people down front. And yet you're picking up no PA out of those things at all, because they're down in the center below the lip of the stage. So it's almost all audience out of those, those mics. And as long as there aren't security guys like suddenly standing in front of them, um, you're, you're, uh, th th that's kind of a valuable thing to have. And, and, and if you are posting this for an album, it just gives you another flavor to post in there on the sing-along numbers because those mics, all you're going to get out of those mics is audience. You're hardly going to get any PA at all. So if, if there are numbers where there's a lot of call and response, you can, it's almost like the audience is in an ISO booth with those, those uh, PCMs down below the, of the stage. So that's something I've been doing a lot of, of lately. But, but uh, one last bit about ambient mics. I, I tell my students at Harris where I teach, think of the microphones as floodlights. And if you were trying to light that room with four floodlights and only four floodlights, what would you do? Well, you'd put the lights up high and you point them at people. So wherever you would point, where, where, whatever you would do to light that crowd with four lights, that's where you'd position the mics. And that's where you'd point those audience mics, you know? So again, up high is key, I think. Totally agree with Luke on that. You're going to get less PA and you're going to get more coverage. If you put them down too low, you're just going to get the people in the front row. And and, uh, and you know you can get really beat on that. We we did a comedy show once where we kept hearing this jangling, you know, and we'd go out and it would stop, and we'd come back. And it turned out it was a woman with bracelets on, and whenever she would clap her hands, the, the it would jangle, and it was and it was it was you know, and if you we'd only had a handful of a few mics, we wouldn't have been able to get rid of it. But luckily, we just lost that mic for the rest of the show and used the other five uh, because uh, she was right under a shotgun mic with this jangly jewelry, we couldn't really do much about it. Sometimes you get the person with the hyena laugh too, or the, or the loud whistling guy, you know, and, and, and you want to lose that person. Otherwise it's going to be all, like people get to know that they're on a live album and they spot an audience mic and they start playing to it, you know? So the more mics you have, the less chance there are that that person can dominate your, your live mix, you know? So I'm going to jump to something that um, is a little more, I don't want to say controversial, but it's a different thought process. Um, I'm pretty sure Doug's opinion is whatever you send me, 
I try and get a good mix, a good level with the band likes and send it out. Um, and Luke, I read one of, uh, an article and I watched some YouTube videos and you're saying you love to, I shouldn't say love, but you're a believer in putting auto-tune on all the vocals because that cleans up the mix and makes people want to mix more. I'm, and I think, Doug, you're a little bit more, what they send me, they go, because I don't think you put auto-tune on. What's your philosophy? How and why do you do what you do with that? And would you change where you would do it versus where you wouldn't? Um, and Dion, you can jump in as well. Luke, I'll let you start. Sure, no problem. This might be my last uh, response because I need to jet out here in just a few minutes. But um, <clears throat> yes, I'm a huge fan of autotune. Uh, in my 10 years of working with Bethel Music, Bethel Church, our, every vocal is tuned all the time, whether it's a record or live broadcast. And when I say live, I mean truly live broadcast. It's truly live. It's not remixed. The vocals are tuned. And um, we use Antares Autotune. And it's very important that you set the right key. We don't do a chromatic tuning. We set the correct key, which means you have to get a set list with the keys ahead of time to be able to make those changes on time. Uh, but even then, I don't trust a set list because so many times last minute, they'll say, hey, let's play it a half step down. And then suddenly your auto tune is messed up. Yeah. So uh, I don't even trust set list. I wait till the song starts and I identify the beat, the, the key they're in, and then I make the change. Um, and you apply it to all the vocals. So what Wait, this what, what, does- what, Like a pitch pipe or how do you, how do, you do that in real time? Um, I have really good relative pitch. So uh, as long as I hear one note, I know what every other note is. Uh, if you don't have that, then you could just pull up your phone with a little piano in it and just tap out some notes until you identify. Hopefully you understand scale theories to be able to identify. Or if you don't just have a buddy sit next to you that could help you identify <laughs> the key. Uh, but what this does is it, uh, to me, <clears throat> I, a good mix is one that gets out of the way. Uh, you don't want to be thinking about the mix. You want to be thinking about the song, be thinking about the message, right. the lyrics. That's the goal. And distractions are the enemy of that. And so um, to me, what is a distraction? A distraction is that kid screaming in the audience. A distraction is your kick drum is super flubby and doesn't have punch. A distraction is off-tune vocals. A distraction is... Uh, the drums are super flammy and they're not on time with the rest of the band and everybody's out of sync. And so what distractions can we get rid of in a mix and what do we have control over and what don't we have control over? I know that I have control over pitch. I can do that. And it, when done well, it removes one less distraction in your mix, which allows the audience to better connect with the message, with the song, with the artist, which is the goal. And on a plus side, it also gives a greater confidence with the artist knowing that they're being taken care of. Like I said earlier, we have the audience, or sorry, we have the band come back to the screen room after they're done. If they come back here and they know that they're going to get publicly humiliated against the wall because they're singing flat the whole time, they don't want to come back. They don't want to put it out all on the line again because they know last time they did that, it hurt too much. And pain is easy to remember. It's easy to remember pain. And so uh, my job is to help those artists so that when they come back to this room, they feel like I'm safe, I'm protected. And next time I go out there, I know that I've got a team behind me that's got my back and I'm going to take a risk this time because last time it worked out. I'm going to give it all. I'm going to put it out on the line. So it's Antares Autotune Live and um, you can get that in a console format through a plugin, through various outboard gear, or you can just do it um, uh, via a plugin inside of a... Uh, digital audio workstation. And before I go, sorry, one more note. I also do blend drum replacement. I use Steven Slate Trigger and it's not full on replacement, but it allows you to blend in additional tones into your drums live. And so if you're not happy with the snare drum and they tuned it weird, you can blend in a little, a little uh, more low end to it. Or if the kick is not hitting you right or something, or the mic placement's not good and you're in a, you're in a pinch and you can't run up on stage and move the microphone, then you blend in some of the replacement there. So those are two tools that kind of make it a little bit uh, oh, helpful. Sorry. How instantaneous is that, Luke? Like, is, is there any sort of lag, audible lag on the drum, on the real-time drum thing? Or? Yeah, so both Autotune and Steven Slate Trigger have live mode, and they also have what's called normal mode. And uh, live mode is very low latency. I'm not sure what it is. It's just a few samples of audio. It's, it's almost completely unintelligible. Um, 
But if you do normal mode, it gives more look ahead time, which means um, it's transient detection is better. So you're, you're gonna be um, replacing the transients that matter and not the ones that don't matter. And with auto-tune, if you do the higher latency mode, it allows greater look ahead time, which means the tuning decision of whether or not to pull it up or down will have a better understanding of its intended target. So I actually prefer the high latency version of all of those. Um, I have everything as high latency as possible so that um, the look ahead time is better for trigger detection as well as auto-tune pitch detection. And um, then we send that to video world. And, and ironically, or what, crazily, is um, video also has delay. So the camera has latency. The SDI uh, converter has latency, the switcher has latency, all of those add up to actually in our world, uh, audio and video line up perfectly. And in fact, I think we have to delay ours like 1.3 milliseconds or something like that. We have to delay the audio. It's, it's, still, um, it's still faster than video, but not everybody's that way. Um, it really depends on your camera gear, the type of switchers you're using, the type of uh, SDI conversion you're using and stuff. Uh, a free tool to timeline audio and video is um, OBS, OBS software, completely free. And you can drop both your audio and video live stream into that. And then you can just nudge forward or backwards, however much you want. Or you can buy a hardware unit, which is a, it's a frame delay unit. Those are very expensive, but you can um, push video back uh, backward or forward if you'd like. And you, you have also um, a patch that you sell as well for consoles or a console or for your for Pro Tools? Yeah, uh, it's called the template. Um, and so the same template that I use on that, that I use every week for Bethel Music, Bethel Church um, uh, is a digital download. And it's available, I believe, on five different digital audio workstations. So Pro Tools, Logic, Studio One, Reaper, Ableton Live. And they all have the same sound, uh, same plugin structure. And so you can um, access that on the plugin that you feel most comfortable with. Pro Tools is great, but it's very expensive when you get over 32 channels. So I would only recommend that if you have a lot of money or if you're under 32 channels. Um, if you don't have that, uh, sorry, if, if that's a problem for you, I'd highly recommend Studio One. Strangely enough, that might be a surprise to a lot, a lot of people, but Studio One is a fantastic workflow and it has something called scenes. The thing that digital audio workstations don't really have, uh, they haven't really figured out until now is the ability to recall scenes or recall show, show files. Um, Doug would understand this, but like you have these presets on a console and you just push one button and like an SD9 or a console, just yeah. boom, reload everything. When you have a festival of nine different bands and you want to reload all of those things, Pro Tools doesn't have that. Logic doesn't have that unless you close down this, the, the save session, open a new one. Studio One, on the other hand, allows you to save scenes within the same show file. So when you're doing a sound check the day before with your rehearsals, you get all your settings right for that band. When they get off the stage, you hit save the scene. Boom, the next band comes up, you do another scene. So it's really great for like festival type things where you have a lot of uh, scene changes or even theatrical things. If you want to make uh, a lot of changes with one click, it's super helpful. And there's no uh, channel count limitation uh, with that. I mean, there is, but uh, it's, it's much more affordable for people to get in. <laughs> well, guys, I'm so sorry, but I need to jet out of here. So uh, I apologize, but it's been so fun uh, hanging with you. I've learned a lot uh, just from hearing uh, Dion and Doug. So I appreciate you hearing your expertise on this one. It was a pleasure. Thank you for coming, Luke. Thank you, Luke. Yeah, of Take course. Care. Bless you guys. Yeah. See you later. Right. You. A couple of things too. Uh, you know, the, the whole key to this, uh, especially the younger guys that are out there listening to this, is that every time you talk to an engineer that has some experience, if you walk away with one or two more tricks for your bag of tricks, it's you end up with a big bag of tricks after a year or so. You know, I, I, I've been at this for a long time and, uh, and uh, I'm usually the oldest guy in the room with any room I walk into these days. But I still hardly ever does a gig go by where I don't learn something that I didn't know before. Like every show, something happens. That, oh, that, you know, and then you file it away and maybe two years later, you put, oh, that happened before. It's this, you know, and that, a lot of these things are not in any textbooks. They're not in any uh youtube videos they're just you pick them up over lunchtime talking to other engineers and and uh, and uh and from different genres you know heavy metal and gospel and country and jazz it, it, it all comes in handy eventually you know you, you can't kind of just look at one slice of the the pie you know it's a it's a big musical pie out there and we can learn something from 
from each, uh, you know, every time I have a guest engineer in the truck, they, they, you know, they'll have a, some way of using Pro Tools or some way of using the, con oh, I hadn't thought of that before, you know, and, and uh, never figure that you've got it all sussed out because it's, it's a constant thing, you know. So, Doug, let me ask you this, and then we'll yeah. go to Dion. So, what's your thought on the the, the auto or I won't say what's your thought for those who don't have auto tune or who are still using the analog boards because still a lot of churches are still using yeah. the old Mackie boards. What can they do to help fix the vocals? It's tough, man. I'm about, although I'm not being an old dude, I I don't you know I'm not an auto tune guy. I mean, the only time I use auto tune is when the band comes in and they say we're going to send you the lead singer's vocal post, like they have an auto tune rig out of the front of the house and then, and I'm getting the vocal after that. You know, I've done a few things with the Elmo combo where that's happened. And, and it's weird because it's another thing between you and the singer, but I get it, you know, and you know, I, I hate to be old man shouts at cloud, but, but my good friend, Ron Dan once, once said to me, he says, you know, we were, we were on a panel judging uh, uh, demo tapes for factor grants for, for grants for uh, recording. And we, we got a couple of them from singers that were not, their tuning was less than great. And, and Ron, Ron was this great pedal steel player that passed away a few years ago. But he said, you know, Doug, I always thought, call me crazy, but I think if you want to have a career as a singer, being able to sing would be a good prerequisite for that. So, so that's a bit of an old bogey attitude maybe, but, but I'm, I'm not a big auto-tune guy. So, I mean, I have a, a, an Atari's um, auto-tune hardware uh, unit in my rack in the truck that I do pull out on occasion, but very reluctantly. The problem I find, I didn't get a chance to talk to Luke about this, but I find in a live situation, if I've got auto tune on a significant number of vocals, there's so much bleed from the instruments coming behind the singers into their vocal mics that if they get severely out of tune, not only does the, and the auto tune shifts their voice, it also shifts the guitar and the keyboard that's behind them. And then the instruments start to get weird. So have you ever heard of that, Dion? Like, like I, I find I haven't had much luck using auto-tune in live situations for that reason, that the instrument lead starts to get tuned by the auto-tune, and then it draws attention to things that are, are shifting rather than drawing it away. But, What's your yeah. opinion on that, Dion? Yeah, for, my, for the background vocalists, uh, these are some tricks that I learned from Doug. How to just... Uh, use a chorus and a, and a doubler and that just blend that in with the yeah. the background vocals and it, it kind of smears out like the differences in um the pitch and also the vibratos so yeah. you find um if you're especially um if you have a good uh trio like you know um soprano alto tenor if you have six singers, even better because then you can sort of blend them in, especially if they're really good. They're blending well together in pairs. And I just, I just find where it's happy as far as who's really on pitch. And you know, it could be where the melody line um, is, where the sopranos, it could be the altos. You find where that is and you, you put that on a little bit on top and you just blend the rest underneath. And I find that works. Um, as far as using auto tune, I'm doing that most in posts. So I'll, for for people that are using Waves, uh, Waves has a tuning plugin that I also use, and I, I I just have it in my utility belt. Like I can use either or, yeah. but um, depending on the application, I find that um, I've I've seen good results with the Waves tune, not creating an auto tune sound, but just putting them back. In, in alignment with the, the pitch. And um, there are cases that I've had to even use um, in a chromatic setting, not knowing the, the key. And until I find the key, then I'll go over. But uh, it's, it's a workflow that you kind of have to build in, not just to apply the actual um, plugin, but just to go through all the channels that have it on and be able to change change the key appropriately. Yeah, because you can get yourself down into the wormhole pretty quickly. Like if you just fix yeah. all, and then you end up fixing 45 things and, and then yeah. you listen to it and it actually sounds like a, like, like T-Pain. Like it starts to sound like a robot and then yeah. and you have to, you know, maybe, okay, I'll fix some, I'll fix the worst offenders. I use Melodyne. I'm not, yeah. I'm not that amazing at it to tell you the truth, <laughs> but, but, but I, you know, I, I, I'll do some corrective surgery 
in there with, with Melodyne, but but live, I, I, I don't use it. You know, I, I just, I leave it. You know, I figure, I, what would I have heard if I was sitting in the front row? I would have heard that person sing out of tune. That's on the singer. That's not on me. I, 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 I can only, I can add a little reverb and add a little chorusing as, as Dion says, those, those two things are your friends. But, yeah. but at some point, the onus has to be on the artist to you know, perform well. I, I, I mean, we can only do so much plastic surgery. <laughs> um, <laughs> so speaking of surgery, I'm going to shift topics here because I'm sure we can go down that road and, yeah. and never get off of it. Um, and then maybe this will be the last question as I'm looking at our time as we're at yeah. eight o'clock already here. Um, so I'll do it as, as a three point question. A lot of churches have volunteers and they don't get to spend a lot of time on working on their mixes. So what would be the th three simplest things a church can do to improve their, their broadcast mix. The, the most common thing, what we found is that most people that are engineers are, are musicians. We play guitar, we play keyboards, we play whatever we play. And, and you find that we listen to music differently than the average person out there in, like Larry the listener, as I call them, out there at home listening. Um, they don't really care what the floor tone sounds like. You know, they don't really care that there's hi-hat bleeding into the snare drum. Um, they are primarily interested in, in, especially in worship music, the lead vocal. They are, they are either moved by the emotional content of the singer or by the message in the lyrics. And so, therefore, the vocal has to be louder than the typical recording engineer thinks it needs to be. Like, Because we, we're listening to the guitar, we're listening to the keyboards. The average listener is not. They they are moved by but they buy that record or listen to that artist because they want to hear the words or they want to be moved by the emotional content of the singer. So that means you have to ride that vocal higher in the mix than you think it needs to be to make the majority of the listeners out there happy. When my when I hear complaints, I, I don't know. I mean, the recent most recent case in point is the is the Super Bowl halftime show. The amount of stuff on my news feed. That it, where the vocal was too quiet. Like, believe me, nobody ever complains that the vocal is too loud. You will never get that complaint. I've never, I think in the 40 years I've done, that vocal was awfully loud. But the, if, if it is too quiet, my mom is phoning me up. I couldn't make out the words. I couldn't, you know, this is the other thing about, you know, when we're doing records, you've heard the song 86 times, you know the words. But Larry, the listener, is hearing it for the first time at home. They don't know the words. So you have to, Resist your own biases and boost that vocal a little. I'd rather err on it being too loud, 5% too loud, than being too quiet, because I know I'm not going to get the phone call from the manager the next day saying we couldn't, we had people complaining they couldn't make out the vocals. Whereas if it's too loud, I'm not going to get that phone call. So we, we, we have to, you know, we don't think anything of spending 40 minutes getting a drum sound, but if you take five minutes getting a lead vocal sound, people are, hey, come on, let's let's go. That seems to be a lot for a lot of time, but it's it's the key thing. And and, and um, this stretches back to 15, 20 years ago. Somebody um, gave me a cassette. That's how long ago it was, and it was all the number one songs, all the Billboard number one songs from 1955 to 1980 in a row on a ninety minute cassette. And they just taken the hook lines, like just the 12 or 10, 10 seconds of the, the most identifiable part of that song. So it's just like song, blah, 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 blah. song, blah, blah, blah. And you hear it kind of ebb and flow, you know, all the different music in the different years. And I'm sitting there as an engineer saying, these were all, every one of these songs was a million selling song. Like what do they have in common technically? Like is it the bottom end, is it the top, what is it? And the only thing I could spot after I listened to it a couple of times was, I noticed that the lead vocal was right in your face on all those hit songs. Like it's, it's, it's built around the vocal. And I, I do know country music engineers who mix singles. I, I always start with the drums because that's just the way I was trained. But those guys start with the lead vocal and get the lead vocal really happening and then build everything around the lead vocal. Because in country music, the lead vocal is, is key and certainly is in gospel music too. So, so um, and worship music. So, don't lose sight of what you're there for. Um, you know, if, if, if people are there to, to see uh, um, Fred Hammond or something, like, like, it's not a band, it's Fred Hammond. Like, that's who they're there to see. So, so 
that lead vocal, we really have to pay attention to make sure that that's on top of the mix at all times. And sometimes that means having a compressor on the lead vocal and a compressor on the band bus, like a, the, 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 a, some sort of a bus that has the whole band on it, and let the vocal ride on top of that band all the time, you know. Um, but but never lose uh, sight of the fact that, that the average listener is there for the, the the message and the lead vocal thing, and it, it's 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 very very key that that not get lost. And and I know when I when I'm doing a band, I don't get a sound check. Every so often you do a show and something happened, and the guy missed his flight, or some, and you do, don't get a sound check. When I start off, I have that vocal up pretty darn loud relative to everything else because I figure I gotta at least hear that singer in those first thirty seconds. Did you guys notice on the on the Super Bowl you couldn't hear the weekend when he walked out? The first 10 seconds, his vocal wasn't in that mix. And that was just the exact opposite of what you want. I, I, um, um, so I always start with the vocal up and then I'll, I'll bring the band bus up under it. But rather than the other way around, because people will just freak out if they can't hear that, that. They see that face on the screen and they can't hear it. People get, you know, you know there's mistakes. And then there's mistakes your mother would notice. That's a mistake your mother would know. She's on the phone. Like, when Celine Dion walked out and you couldn't hear, was that a yes, mom? That was a mistake. You know, and I just know on the intercom there's just people screaming, "Where's the vocal?" <laughs> you know, and 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 so that's I can't emphasize that enough. Um, make make sure you, you keep that out, out, out front. You know. Yeah, I, I think um, for uh, I guess churches that have digital consoles you have the luxury of doing the virtual sound check. I think that you should use that as your, as a tool um, for your volunteers so that um, when everyone's gone, they can spend some time. And that's what I did for the volunteers that work um, in our ministry. We, we would just, I would just put them in the room with the console and I uh, would just make sure that they understand where everything's coming up. Track list is good. BCAs are laid out. According to, um, you know, I have the drums, I have a click track, BCA, I have um, keys, background vocals, I have an effects VCA. And um, so that, that you have as much control over the different elements and then I have a band VCA. So like Doug was saying, you know, you have, you can grab the band and bring the band down and have some more control over the band versus, you know, the vocal. Um, what what Doug was describing there is is some good nuggets. Um, in our community, we say that over the years we said like we're not mixing, we're not doing any recordings without Doug. We we rather eat glass <laughs> than do a recording <laughs> without Doug. So he's giving a wealth of information here, and it seems like simple, but um, it's it's paramount. You gotta you gotta make sure that the uh, Primary focus is on, you know, the lead person that could be the person that's speaking also. So, you know, tucking down the band when maybe the uh, person who's going to be the pastor is speaking, just tucking the band under so that they can be heard and, and audible. And um, I think that's key. Also, just just taking some time to know your gear. So coming two hours early and maybe spending two hours you know, after just to make sure the gear is still working, no one, no one, um, you know, plugged out the DI. So now this, the keyboard is uh, mono or you lost um, some channels because somebody plugged out, you know, the wireless rack or one of the paddles are down. So it's checking your gear before you, you set up. I think that's, that's, you know, paramount because, you know, not, nothing like having um, dropouts on your wireless during the broadcast, you know, and, just because it just because it worked last Sunday doesn't mean it's working this Sunday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. check, yeah, check your gear, check yeah. the gear at the source, yeah. and um, usually it's it's at the source that you're having most of the issues. I think once you get those elements working um, together, as far as you know, clean tracks. You know, Doug is big on clean. I want it clean, and we'll spend the time making sure things are clean. And when I set up the drum mics, I'm always setting it up from drummer's perspective, not audience perspective. <laughs> So make sure, you know, you jump left and right are correct. Especially if you're working with Doug, because he'll tell you to change it back. <laughs> well, right? you know, because I'm watching <laughs> the screen. It drives me nuts when I see a drummer drew a roll across the toms and, and the sound goes the other way. And it's just like into the ditch. So yeah, yeah. In, in, TV, in TV, we always, uh, 
we always do it yeah. from the camera perspective. But if, if this engineer is a drummer, they like to do it from drum yeah. perspective because that's the hi hats on this side when they're playing the instrument. I, I'm not a drummer, so I don't have that yeah. bias player, so I can I can kind of get away with it. But, uh, but yeah, but I but I you know I learned a lot of stuff on those early gospel shows too, uh, Dion from from you know how to mic up a Leslie properly and oh yeah. How many mics do you really need on a choir to make it work, and, and all that sort of stuff? So, so, so those, those were, uh, you know, going back to Oswald Burke and the Revival Airs, which was the first gospel group I ever recorded. You know, and uh, you know, yeah, the, the, the milk you, truck days. Yeah, you, you, you learn, <laughs> you learn a lot of. Uh, like I say, you learn some, something happens every every gig that, 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 that's new. But but for the new people, yeah, I, I as Dion says, show up early, stay late, ask lots of questions. Don't don't hesitate. Um, I mean, I look back at my early days when I came to town and some of the mentors for me were people like Terry Brown and David Green and Peter Houston. And, and I realize now when I was in my 20s, I was like this little yappy dog. So let's put two mics in the hi-hat. And, and I thought, oh, I look back now and I think, oh, I must have been so annoying to those people. And yet they took the time to turn around. I was like, no, you do it this way and run your cables this way. And I always think, now, when, I, when I'm out on the road and I, I have a student assistant helping the stuff, I think, listen, man, a lot of people had a lot of patience for you when you were young answering your questions. So take time and answer these people's questions because they're just trying to, you know, they're you when you were 21 or 19 or whatever. And they're, they just want to get better at their craft the same way you did. And, and, you know, take a breath and explain it to them because it's not that obvious to them. And so everybody... You know, we, we all try to pass the torch to the young guys coming up because, uh, you know, and, and I learn stuff from them sometimes too, man. Since the younger engineers come from computer world, sometimes somebody will look over, hey, why are you doing that this way? You know, and I, yeah, you know, you're right. I'm just doing it this way because I've done it that way for 30 years. But why don't I, you know, so, so I, I learn stuff from the younger fry too. You know, you gotta, you can't be too set in your ways. We're in a technological industry and the technology is changing. And, the laws of physics don't change, you know, but 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 some of the methods do, and so we're we're all there to try to make every show you do better than the last show, you know, and, and just do it well enough that you get hired back, because <laughs> you know, yeah. everybody can do a show once, yeah. but but uh, you know you want to do it well enough and 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 uh, get, getting along with you know again you can be a technical genius, but if you're a jerk to work with, nobody's going to hire you back, you know you you, you want to be uh, a pleasant person to be trapped in a room with for 12 hours. It's like being trapped in an airport for somebody for 12 hours. Like, you know, and, and so uh, um, sm a smile and, and, and sometimes too, um, being able to admit what you don't know, like saying, gee, I'm sorry, you know, I really, I haven't used that piece of gear before. Um, I, you know, like, like it's better doing that than, than, than saying you know how to do it and make a mistake. Like sometimes you have to kind of own up and say, really, that's not my area of, I know I've, I've never mic'd a set of bagpipes before or a sitar or something, you know, and, and how would, you know, when you've recorded before, how, how did they, uh, what, what was the best sound you ever got on that, that instrument? You know, you, they might remember where they put the mic, the last guy put the mic and, and you can kind of build on that. But so sometimes you gotta, or you can always, always, oh, wait a minute. And, and I have to go to the washroom and on the way to the washroom, you grab the manual and <laughs> look it up. And, oh yes, it's this, it's this button. I know how to do that. But, but, uh, as, as they say, in order to train a dog, you have to know at least 10% more than the dog. So <laughs> you, have to, you have to know a little bit about the stuff. But, but uh, it's, it's a, you, you're never totally finished uh, learning. But uh, yeah, get out there and volunteer. You know, talk to your local cable station, your local Rogers Cable or whatever, and um, your local church, your, your, your whatever. You know, every time you're out there pushing the fader, you're learning something. You know, I was expecting to hear at least one tip to be make sure you have enough batteries for the microphone. From that's what I was waiting for. But no yeah. one said anything about batteries. Oh, yeah. well, make sure your equipment works, man. I hate it when a band arrives. We were talking about bands being prepared. I hate it when a band shows up and we get into the sound check and the guy's guitar cuts out and oh, it's this cable that's been acting up for a month. It's like, why did you bring it to a live broadcast? Like, fix that stuff. Put new strings on your guitar. Put new heads on the drums. Um, I didn't know my guitar needed a battery. Uh, uh, yeah, but dead battery. And it's Sunday and everything's, you know, it's, it's Sunday night at eight o'clock and they need some nine volt battery for their pedal or, or, their, um, or, or that drum, the drum's rattling, you know, and oh yeah, it's been rattling for like six weeks. Well, 
you know, fix that before you get here. Like, like don't delay the whole band because now you have to take the top hat off the snare drum and take a piece of metal that's a nut or something that's rattling around. Dion, were you on that shoot where we were doing some choir out at Crossroads Christian Communications and the drums had a rattle. They had this old drummer and the drums had a rattle in them. And I said, I can't get rid of it. And we took the head off the drum and it was filled with crumpled up newspapers. And the newspapers were dated like 1971. Like this guy had had these newspapers in his drum for like 30. They were yellow, like the newspapers. And uh, he says, well, I don't really hear it on stage. I said, yeah, but you don't have a thousand dollar microphone six inches away from that wow. drum the way we do on a broadcast. Of course, we're going to hear that, that noise, you know. So make sure your gear is working. You can find that out for free at your rehearsal hall rather than bringing that to the live stream broadcast and having to delay the whole band while you, you know, put new strings on your guitar or tune your, you know, whatever it is. That's really annoying when, when, when bad cables and bad batteries and bad pedals show up. We, we once had a, we were doing a live broadcast with, uh, on Much Music with the band Sloan. And they, uh, it was a live nationwide television show, one of those intimate and interactive shows. And in the opening number, the, ba the drummer broke his bass drum pedal. And you never realize, you know, there's no end run. <laughs> there's no easy way to get around that. And they went to commercial and we grabbed a screwdriver, a Robertson screwdriver, and wrapped gaffer tape around the head of the screwdriver and put it in his pedal. And he used that for the rest of the show as a, as a bass drum. Uh, you know, it's one of those things that you don't think of like, wow, what are we going to do? With the what would we do with the bass drum pedal broke 30 seconds into the first song? Do we have a second one in a case nowhere? Yeah. Uh, so you never know. Gaff tape does wonders. <laughs> 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 well, I want to thank you gentlemen for joining us. I, I know Luke had to go, uh, had to skedaddle because he had some other things, but Doug and Dion, we thank you so, so much for joining us. Like We've learned so much. I think we covered three points, but there's so much. And we almost have to have you all back again for like part two of how to <laughs> yeah. fix your mix here. <laughs> kind of idea. Um, but all of you who have also been watching, we want to thank you for joining us. I hope you've learned a lot uh, from, from these gentlemen. I know I sure did. And... Um, and we're hoping to have them back. Maybe, you know, should we do, get them to do a workshop or something? I think it would be great to get them to do a workshop. Yeah. And we'll talk to Doug. Um, I know we started a conversation with you, Doug. We'll continue that. And Dion, yeah. and maybe we'll even try and get Luke in. Yeah, definitely. Get you all three in there. That would be awesome. But well, we'll stay tuned for that. <laughs> well, the very, the very, the people that are watching this, to me, the very fact that you're watching a video like this shows how passionate you are about your craft and wanting to get better at your craft. I mean, that's the first step is admitting that you don't know everything and you want to seek some additional information. And, and uh, that's fabulous. So, so good for you. Good on you. It gives you that much of an edge over the next guy, you know, who's at home watching basketball or something. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. Well, I have a few announcements that I want to make before we, before we sign off. One is, um, well, you're here. You're here on YouTube. If you haven't already, I hope you like this video and you subscribe so you know when we are running more videos. Um, we are. We have some fabulous guests that are coming on our show next week. We have Glenn Kaiser and Fresh IE because our focus will be on pioneers, learning from the pioneers of music. And it'll be so fabulous to hear their stories about how, you know, how they come up with, with songs and, and how they... Um, I guess, push the edge of the envelope, if you want to call it, in their areas of, of expertise. And it's so interesting because Glenn started with the rock side, right? Yes. And now he's blues and you know, fresh eye. Blue, blues and folk, one string, one string guitar. If you want to see a guy play one string guitar, it's Glenn Kaiser. Okay. And we have Fresh IE, who is a rapper, but he's, he's trying to mix rap with worship in, in his area. And he was also nominated for the Grammy. So he's, he's, recognized internationally. So it'll be interesting to hear their stories. That's next week. Um, we also um, are doing a Christmas compilation again. You might remember that last last year, last December, we, we invited songwriters and musicians to bring your songs, um, Christmas themed songs, so we can put it on a compilation and kind of go through the whole process of what it takes to get a, a song from inception to out there. And well, 
we did it and we sold some albums and you know what? we want to do it again so if you've missed the last time you have a chance this time we are now opening opening our doors so to speak to accept your song submission so if you have got a song feel free to go to gmihub.ca and learn how you can submit your song. If you don't have a song yet, that's okay because we're still accepting songs until June 13th, so you have some time. So if you have any questions, again, go to gmihub.ca and you'll get all the details there. Um, you can also follow us on Facebook, on uh, Instagram, and on Twitter, all G well, GMI Hub, or uh, for Twitter, it's at Industry Gospel. You'll get lots of information from there too. Um, have I missed anything? Um, also, we have a newsletter. So if you do go to gmihub.ca, we invite you to, to sign up to get our newsletter. And here's why. I know every organization has a newsletter, but this one's a little bit different. And how it's different is this. It has one section in there that's called Members Happenings. And what that simply means is this. You send us your email, you're a member. If you got stuff happening, we write in the newsletter, everybody in the community community knows about it. So whether you're doing a concert, releasing a song, or some other happening is happening related to your music or your or your tech or whatever you're doing, we'll put it in there because we think it's a great way to build community. Our mantra, as you know, is building unity, community, mentorship, and talent growth. I love the fact that um, these gentlemen did bring up the mentorship quality and it's a two-way street. Doug, as just to steal from you and your words, you know, sometimes we, we, it's usually people, the younger looks to the older for, for the mentorship, but even the older learn from the younger. So, you know what, it's a two way street. So, you know, we want to encourage that. And we are seriously looking towards providing some workshops and online workshops. So again, tune into gmihub.ca, which is our website to get more information about that. I've said a lot, but I want to say thank you. And we hope to see you next week. We're signing off now, though. God bless. And still remember, GMI Hub encourages unity, unity community, community, mentorship, and, and talent, talent growth. growth.